1633, Rome, Galileo, nearly 70 years old, slowly knelt before the clergy. This Europe's greatest mind was forced to recite a prepared confession. He was forced to admit that error. The earth is stationary. As legend says, after signing, the old man shakily rose. Staring at the cold marble floor, he muttered words only he can hear. And yet, it still moves. Rewind to a time before telescopes. The idea that Earth moves sounded crazy. After all, common sense said the ground was solid only if you're drunk. In the fourth century BC, Aristotle wove this intuition into a sacred order. The universe is like an onion wrapped in layers. Heavy earth and water sank to the center of our stationary world. Light, air, and fire rose upward. Beyond the moon was pure ether. The sun, stars, and planets were fixed to crystal spheres, rotating in perfect circles. It seemed perfect as it matched the physics of falling objects. And it flattered human ego as if we were the center of God's attention. But this perfect model had a fatal flaw. The planets wouldn't follow the script especially Mars. Every two years, it would suddenly slow down, stop, then backtrack, drawing a strange loop. To maintain the perfect circle, in the second century AD, Ptolemy became a frantic math fixer. He said planets move in a big circle around Earth and in a smaller circle on itself. Still not matching? Add another circle. In the end, the geocentric model became a mechanical monster with over 40 gears. It was clunky, but it predicted celestial events. So human just accepted this mathematical patchwork. And this lasted for 1,400 years. Until 1543, a Polish priest, on his deathbed, revolted it. Copernicus touched the printed on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres then, he died. He put the sun at the center, not to rebel, but because he thought Ptolemy's model was ugly. He realized, if Earth moves, those planetary loops are just illusion. Earth overtaking on an inside lane. Like passing a car on the highway, the other car seems to move backward. But Copernicus was even more obsessed with perfect circles. He still forced planets into uniform circular motion. To fit the data, he stuffed over 30 epicycles back into his sun-centered system. Despite a cardinal had urged him to publish it earlier, Copernicus was afraid of being wrong, so that he delayed it until his death. The book's preface even had a disclaimer. This is just a mathematical trick for calculation, not reality. The book was like a drop of ink falling into a clear water. It made little splash until an ill-tempered Danish nobleman appeared, Tycho Brahe. In his youth, he lost his nose in a duel sparked by a math argument and wore a gold and silver prosthetic for life. He had the sharpest naked eyes in human history. In an era without telescopes, he had improved the precision of astronomical observational tenfold to within one arc minute. That's like seeing the edge of a coin from 100 meters away. In 1577, he tracked a comet that sailed through the supposed crystal spheres. Thus, Aristotle's model shattered. The universe wasn't a closed solid. Planets floated in space. Tycho left massive data, but he died believing Earth did not move. His data went to his student, Johannes Kepler, a man with such poor eyesight he could barely see the stars. Kepler believed in Copernicus. He believed orbits must reflect divine geometry. He tried every perfect circle to match Tycho's Mars data, but no matter what, his calculations were still off by eight arc minutes. To others, that's negligible. To Kepler, it was God whispering. For those eight arc minutes, he committed spiritual deicide. After countless sleepless nights, he killed the sacred circle in his mind. Trembling, he drew an ugly ellipse. All the error vanished. No more constant speed. Planets accelerated near the sun. 
slowed down far away. No epicycles, no the ferrets. Just elliptical orbits. 1609. On the other side of the Alps, Galileo raised his magic wand. With a simple telescope, he saw the moon's craters. He saw four moons orbiting Jupiter. He saw the death sentence for geocentrism, and he saw the phases of Venus. In geocentric model, Venus sits between Sun and Earth, so we see only a crescent. But its full cycle proves that Venus circles behind the Sunday. Galileo saw the physical truth, but he was in a hurry, too confident. He thought telescope evidence would convince the Pope but he underestimated the political sensitivity towards heresy. After all, in 1600, Bruno had been burned, for he mixed heliocentrism with pantheism. Bruno wasn't truly a martyr for science. He only used heliocentrism as a tool to proclaim. But he made the church hypersensitive to the moving earth. Despite repeated warnings from the church, Galileo kept challenging the authority with his biting satire. It led to the famous trial mentioned at the beginning. He was arrested for life, but in history, he won. After Galileo died, Newton's law of universal gravitation explained why orbits are ellipses. In 1838, Bessel measured stellar parallax, the final proof of Earth's motion. Thus, human had killed the inner infant, completing a painful rite of passage. Looking back, the geocentric model held strong not just because it worked, but because it was a cradle, protecting our illusion of being special. Science is cruel and beautiful. It offers no comfort, only the truth. Even today, autonomy still lives in our minds. We put ourselves at the center of our world. We patch our beliefs. We twist reality only to fit our expectations. All of these are just to keep a sense of safety. But the universe doesn't care. Admitting we are not the center is the price. Only after shattering that imaginary palace do we truly gain the stars. <laughs>